Kylie Baker and I've been meaning to redo my appendix talk for about five years now but I'm afraid it's taken a COVID pandemic and a very rainy Easter weekend to get the time to do it. Anyway this is just some of my own personal experience in use of ultrasound for appendicitis for more than 10 years now. Now my very favorite um, uh, researcher of all time has got to be Pilot, who's been describing the use of ultrasound for um, appendicitis since 1986 and he is spot on with everything he says. A review he did back in 2000 I think is still 10 years ahead of where we are. There's very little changed. Back then he said that six millimeter diameter was the upper limit of normal for an appendix and um, only slight things have changed since then. One is that our measurements, according to the world consensus, is now we're measuring from the outer dark layer to the innermost dark layer. In other words, when we measure the wall or the diameter, we're no longer measuring the white bit on the outside and the inside. That's because the white edges are composite edges and it's very hard to know where appendix stops and cirrhosis starts. So this is how or where we measure wall thickness and this is how or where we measure the appendix diameter. Now we do need to start briefly with anatomy. Um, if we look at the picture on the left here, the uh, black bar down the middle is the iliac vessels, the, the yellow bar underneath is the iliopsoas muscles. The terminal ilium lies across the iliac vessels and it joins the cecum which usually should be in the right paracolic gutter and near that ileocecal valve is where the appendix is attached. For this reason I always make um, a point of finding the cecum first. The second thing to remember is that a normal appendix can often be supidinous. It only blows out like a balloon when it's abnormal. So if you're looking for a normal appendix, you may actually end up seeing several little cross sections. Um, the white blob in the middle is giveaway, but sometimes it can be small and sometimes it can be large. And if you see on this picture, some people complain that it's a bit like looking for a needle in a haystack. Well, my advice obviously is find the haystack first. And this is the sort of thing we'll be looking for, but there's no point looking for this through the entire abdomen. Now, I always insist on starting with a wide view because I've seen too many times where a perforated appendix was missed because people went straight looking for the appendix itself. So I like to start with the curvilinear probe in the suprapubic view. And the reason I start in the suprapubic view is twofold. One is I like to start away from the sore spot, that way people are less apprehensive. And two, I like to make sure there's no surprises down in the pelvis, and particularly how much fluid is there, which I will then compare to how much fluid's in the right iliac fossa when I get there. So I start with a longitudinal view, then I turn 90 degrees and have a look at the bladder in transverse. And from this time, I slide sideways towards the patient's right, paracolic gutter, and towards my hip, and as low as I can on the abdomen so that we're just about the level of the inguinal ligaments or the pubic symphysis. And as we slide laterally, we're looking carefully to try and find the iliac vessels, the artery and the vein. And once we find those iliac vessels, we slide just a little bit rostrally towards the head until we see the first bit of bowel crossing across in front of them. Now this is terminal ileum, and that's a very important handhold for us. Um, terminal ileum is often peristaltic, should move quite a bit. Once we find terminal ileum, we continue our slide laterally until we find a fluffy white cloud. This is what cecal, cecum looks like almost always. Cecum usually has gas in it, and the gas usually sits right up under the abdominal muscles. As I say, it's really important to find the cecum first because um, this is near where the appendix is. If the cecum hasn't descended or if it's sitting in an odd spot, there's no point starting the fine search. This is the fluffy white cloud of cecal gas. 
I do like to confirm we're at the very end of this um, ascending colon and I do this by turning longitudinally and I like to watch that last bit of gas slide up and down with respiration on the um, iliopsoas muscles. People tell us that cecum should be um, retroperitoneal but there's quite a bit of variability. A lot of people didn't read the textbooks. I also feel quite confident when I find a tiny little triangle of fluid, which you'll often see sitting right at the end of the cecum. If it's a little triangle, I'm not concerned, but um, it does tell me this is an area to start looking. Now I'm in the right ballpark because we like to search the appendix around the ileocecal valve. And we found the ileum and we found the cecum. At this point, I would often turn to or swap over to um, a linear probe. This is if we have a small patient. If you have a large patient, you may have to stay with the curvilinear and you will probably see an abnormal appendix, but you won't necessarily see a normal one. I do love the uh, linear probe, particularly if you can find the virtual convex setting. Now, what I've done here is I've simply replaced the uh, curvilinear probe with the um, linear probe in exactly the same spot. We've got it sitting right over the iliac vessels. There's the artery, the vein probably beneath it. Um, this will be a little bit of cecum here, that little bit of gas. And um, before you get excited about the little bit of appendix over the top of the iliac vessel, it's important to realize that a lot of this picture is not necessary. We don't have to pay attention to it. Because everything under the iliac artery is going to be iliopsoas muscle. We don't need to hunt in that area. And everything above the abdominal muscles is, again, we don't need to hunt in that area. So the area where we pay attention is actually quite small. It can be a little bit confusing um, which area to pay attention to. So what you do is watch... Um, the sliding, see which area stays still and which slides. This is the same area in longitudinal. Please ignore the um, measurement of the appendix. You can see we have cecum here, the fluffy white cloud again on the left, and we have the iliac vessels and the iliopsoas muscle underneath, and we have the abdominal muscles on the top. So again, we only actually need to look in this small area. And what we'll be looking for is a white dot with a dark halo. Now, Pilot, right from 1986, described a technique called graded compression, where he gently increased the pressure on his probe, um, never quite letting go. The idea being that he's massaging the gas away from the area. Uh, if you do it slowly, um, many people can tolerate this. Now, an abnormal appendix can be quite easy to spot, but really, we do want you to start looking for a normal appendix. And we're looking for the white dot with a dark halo. Watch it in here. It actually changes size and shape because, as I said, the appendix, when it's normal, isn't a straight line. What's more, it's compressible. There's a little fecalith in it halfway through, I think. At the top here, we've got another little area of fecalith or possibly gas. And if you look at the picture in the bottom, you'll see that same gas-filled appendix as we follow it along. This is not an abnormal one, by the way. And you see how the muscles above move separately to the intra-abdominal contents. I do like the search strategy suggested by Roger Gent, who's a marvellous sonographer from down south. His method is to start very low, essentially at the umbilical vest, um, sorry, the um, inguinal ligament, and track up the iliac vessels right from below the abdominal cavity and to track all the way up the iliopsoas muscle. He says if you can't find that, you turn around and come back again. I like to lie the patient on the left lateral side if I haven't found it in the first pass and then back onto their back because I do think this does tend to move the gas around a little. Now when you find something with a white dot in the center and a dark halo 
it's not enough. You can't hang up your gloves. You've got to actually prove that this is the appendix. Notice on this particular picture, we've got two possibilities, but the one on the right has a sort of floral outline for the internal contour, whereas the one in the center has this slit or white dot. This one in the center is what the appendix looks like. The one on the right is what terminal ileum looks like. It's important to realize this because uh, contracting terminal ileum can look quite like an appendix. So we're proving, if we have to prove what we're looking at at the appendix, it's got to fulfill these criteria. We've got to prove that it's blind ending. In other words, we have to find the end. We've got to watch it long enough to be able to say with confidence that it's not peristalsing. Now, normal small bowel peristalsis is about three times every minute. So you might have to watch it for a while. We should show that it's attached to the cecum. And we really need to show that it's round in cross-section, perhaps oval if it's normal and compressible. So one of the things we have to do is turn 90 degrees. And this isn't all that easy if you have a sapiginous appendix, but we're looking to see that little white dot stretch out to be a little white line. Here's terminal ileum underneath. And you can see it's joining the cecum on the left of the picture. It's really important to save pictures in transverse and long. The picture on the left has um, the um, stripes of the wall quite nicely uh, demonstrated. And on the right, you can see it easily compressible to a nice oval, a small oval. The reason I say this is that terminal ileum can look like a longitudinal appendix. See the picture on the left. But when we turn to 90 degrees, you can see it doesn't ever become a small round lumen. It stays that broad lumen and we still have that sort of floral outline in the middle. As I said, it's important to follow it to the tip. Not all abnormal appendixes are straight and there is such a thing as tip appendicitis. Watch this little follow here. On the left of the picture, you can see a pretty normal appendix diving down into fluffy white cecum on the left. But you'll notice that there's a dark hole on the right with a loss of um, uh, the, the uh, break in the line of the lumen and some bright fat around it. So this is a case where the proximal appendix was normal, but the distal appendix was quite abnormal. The other thing that we really ought to be doing is measuring under compression, as much compression as the patient will tolerate. So the picture on the left is the appendix and you can see that the side walls are actually fairly unclear, but when we compress them, they become more clear. We do have the um, calipers placed in the wrong position though. You're not supposed to be measuring side to side, you're supposed to be measuring anteroposteriorly. Now do be a little bit careful. Sometimes you'll see a tender black hole like this. This is why you have to turn 90 degrees. This one turned into this, which was a um, tender, non-compressible, blind ending tube with non-peristalsing. And it actually lost all those internal wall layers because it had become gangrenous. So, Diagnosing or finding the appendix is one thing, but diagnosing appendicitis is actually a separate thing altogether. They're not all going to be glaringly obvious like this one here. We have to show that the appendix itself is tender, the source of the tenderness. The diameter needs to be at least six millimeters, that's a sensitive measure, or greater than eight millimeters if you want a specific measurement. Sometimes those gas-filled ones can sit in between. It should be not compressible and preferably with supporting signs. Now, it is possible to diagnose appendicitis without supporting signs, but extremely rare. There are some mimics of appendicitis. Um, lymphoid hyperplasia is when the dark inner layer becomes thickened with lymph nodes, uh, lymph tissue. Um, mucus in the appendix gives something that looks like dark onion skinning inside. 
A gas-filled appendix can be a little bit enlarged, bit like this one. And then finally, inflammation as an extension of other diseases, such as inflammatory bowel disease or, for example, cystic fibrosis. This particular one here wasn't in the slightest tender. And of course, please be careful that the thickening of the appendix is actually due to wall thickening, not just contents like this one. This one was, although it had a larger diameter, was found to be normal at operation. And I think that's because it's filled with faeces. Now, supporting signs. This really is where the money is. Supporting signs are great because they are very sensitive. But the problem is they're non-specific. If you see supporting signs, it means something is going wrong, it's just not necessarily going to be the appendix. They're always worth further investigation. In order of the most useful to the least useful, I'm going to start with what I think is the best tip, and that is uh, echogenic or bright fat, sometimes called creeping fat. The CT equivalent of this is fat stranding, and if the CT reports fat stranding, you are bound to see bright mesentery. Probably scattering extra sound waves because it's um, got lots of extra inflammatory cells. That's my theory. When you compress bright fat, it often coalesces, and it, in this case, it's coalescing around an appendix. It's such a common finding, we call it um, thyroid in the abdomen. It's probably the body's attempt to wall off the inflammation. Now, fecalists are touted as an important part of appendicitis, but there are papers that say actually they're not worth a great deal. You can see a fecalith in a normal appendix, often, and some appendicitises don't have fecaliths. So don't get too excited either way is my particular message. This one, however, was associated with a fairly necrotic appendix. Another sign that I do really like is localised ileus doesn't even have to be dilated small bowel, simply small bowel with extra fluid in, in the region of the right iliac fossa always tells me to look closer. The sentinel loop that we talk about on, on x-rays is very much a thing. Vascularity is often um, mentioned by our sonographer colleagues and I think that's because they have very good machines, but it can be quite hard to show increased vascularity on our point of care machines. Another change that you may see is sequel inflammation, where you get some very odd looking swollen, engorged large bowel. Um, now, Pilot back in, oh, I think 2000 said that when you do see sequel inflammation, you're duty bound to keep going till you find the appendix because it may be an extension from acute appendicitis. But on the other hand, it may be a disease entity in itself, a, a colitis or a pancolitis. Yersinia or Campylobacter. So something like this, if you see it, you have to keep going. And finally, lymph nodes. Again, people say lymph nodes are a sign of appendicitis, but unfortunately they're a sign of many other things too. They look like a um, black hole and you, when you first see them, you might think, oh, there's the appendix. But um, they're round in both directions. And if you put a low flow color Doppler on it, you'll notice that they have feeder vessels. So um, lymph nodes, mm, uh, I don't get enthused about them. If there's lots of big ones, you might call them mesenteric adenitis, but you actually have to count them and measure them for that. So in 10 years of scanning appendixes, I've learned lots of things. I do like to start with a wide view and creep up on the right iliac fossa. It's really important as you creep up to watch for what bits move and what don't. Peristalsis is a sign of health. When there's no peristalsis, when there's stiff, bright fat that doesn't compress, that scares me. I think that if I'm going to call appendicitis, the thing that I'm calling appendix must be tender. It must be tender each time you come back to the same spot. The appendix has to be traced to the tip Tip appendicitis is a thing. It can be quite hard to get to the tip if it's right down in the pelvis. You can't clear an appendix if you haven't got to the tip. 
If you want to say this is a dilated appendix, then it's got to be the wall and not the lumen dilating the appendix. If you find supporting signs, particularly bright fat or localised ileus, please keep investigating. And finally, I have discovered that appendixes do grumble. You don't have to take out every borderline appendix at the time. Now, a lot of people will show you a lot of pictures of hot appendixes. You don't need me to show you more. What I do want to show you, though, is a few signs of more serious disease, the sorts of things you might see in perforations. The other thing to warn you about a perforation is that um, perforation will decompress your appendix, so it may not even be a distended appendix once it's perforated. So again, when you get multiple loops of small bowel distended in the right iliac fossa, this is a concern. You see in this picture, we've even got a small amount of free fluid between the loops of bowel, extra worrying. When we lose the layers in the wall of the appendix, that's of a concern. Um, this suggests necrosis and it's more likely to perforate imminently. When you can see right down into the pelvis, that's very scary. Normally gas will stop you seeing deep on a picture. When you can see compressed, inflamed, hypoechoic loops of bowel and right mesentery between, this suggests a very serious inflammatory process and or collection happening. I hate it when I can see right down to the sacrum. Something's usually wrong. And finally, when you have odd shapes of fluid tracking between bowel, not specifically free fluid, I don't think. I think it's more like loculations of pus. This always concerns me. And finally, the appendiceal abscess is usually quite, quite obvious because by the time the mesentery wraps around the necrotic appendix, it becomes quite bright and you can see it with a curved abdominal probe. Um, here's another picture and we can actually see the mesentery wrapping around the end of the perforated appendix. So to my view, point of care ultrasound for appendix should be done by the treating clinician because we're the ones who have all the details in front of us. We have the patient's history, the patient's observations, the patient's blood, and the patient's examination. I think point of care ultrasound for appendix should reach its best possible diagnostic um, features in the hands of an experienced emergency physician. I like it because I can assess tenderness while the patient is distracted and relaxed. I like to return to suspicious areas a couple of times to see if it's painful the second time around. I love looking for supporting signs. I think they're extremely valuable. And it's also a chance to look for other causes. Once or twice I've found um, an obstructed renal stone down in the right iliac fossa. I've certainly found several colitises um, and one or two tumours. So this is how I approach appendix. Now I must admit I've been doing this for a while. I don't think everyone should start straight out with a flow table like this. But I think this is what you can aim for. The main question is whether you have identified the appendix. And if you can positively identify the appendix and trace it to the tip, you should be able to act on your findings without any further investigation. Be it positive or negative. Now, if you can't find the appendix, but you do find supporting signs, then you really should continue. When I was first starting appendicitis, I would say supporting signs or abnormal bloods or consistent tenderness in the same spot. And any of these people, I would keep and observe or investigate further. Now, on the far right, if you can't identify the appendix, but there are no supporting signs of inflammation, there's no abnormal bloods and the tenderness is not all that consistent, then these are the patients that I'm happy to watch at home or investigate as an outpatient. Advise them to come back, obviously, if things get worse, but I often ask the GP 
to arrange an outpatient ultrasound. Anyway, that's how I've been doing appendixes for a while now. I have audited my um, about eight years of work and presented at H&R a year or two ago and um, really happy to talk more about appendixes if anyone wants. Thank you all.